Good morning. Good morning. Once again, we welcome you here to Word Live at the Second Baptist Worship Center. Thank you so much for joining us this morning once again. Uh, I want to take this opportunity to apologize to you last week because there was some technical error that we had. The internet uh, left us, deserted us, and, and so this week we're back and want to take a look at chapter 14 in the book of Leviticus. But as always, before we begin, uh, we remind you to hit that like button and then to share this Bible study with other individuals that you know. So please make that call and let your friends know that the Bible study is officially on this morning and we are excited and chomping at the bits to get to uh, this book of Leviticus once again. Please know that we continue to pray for you, uh, lifting you up before the Lord, asking God to bless you. Uh, whatever your need is, present it to the Lord, for he is faithful and he is merciful and kind enough to do something about it. We remind you to pray not only for uh, the local body of Christ, but to recognize that there are so many individuals that are in desperate need of God's presence and his power. We ask that you to pray for uh, the Israelites and for the relationship of the Palestinians over there uh, near the Gaza Strip. And we're praying that God will intervene and, and that lives might be spared and saved and that somehow there might be some unity in spite of what it is they're facing. And then we're asking uh, that you continue to pray for the leadership of this great nation uh, because it definitely seems to need much prayer. And so we're asking you to ask God's guidance in the leadership uh, of our nation. Also, we pray for those of you who are sick and shut in, who are bound, or who cannot make their way out to the Bible study nor to church, and we're asking God to be with you and to, to just bless you so that indeed you might once again find your way out to the house of the Lord. We're grateful once again for uh, the faithful brothers that make their way out here uh, on Wednesday morning to share with us. And, and so this morning, uh, we want to begin with prayer, and then I'll give you the announcements and we'll move forward in the Bible study. Let's pray, shall we? Father, once again, we are so grateful that you allow us the opportunity to come together uh, to study your word and to learn more about you and the relationship that you have with your people. And so we ask you now to bless us with the manifestation of your Holy Spirit, for he indeed is our teacher, our guide, our provider. And we pray that those truths that are revealed to us, God, that we'll have enough sense to follow. And so we ask you now just to open up our eyes that we might see, uh, our ears that we might hear, and our hearts that we might understand. Uh, bless us mightily, we pray. And then, God, we do pray indeed for those that are at home, for those who are in need of your healing touch. And we pray that you will strengthen and encourage individuals who are caught up in situations they can't get out of, individuals who are in desperate need of your divine touch to heal them. And God, we're claiming your miraculous presence and power over their lives. So just be with us and, and help us, God, to draw closer to you this day. Yeah. Uh, be with us now. We ask it all in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord, and we do thank you. Amen, amen, amen. and amen. And this morning, just as a reminder, uh, we have our empowerment hour, which is held every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. It is a Bible study specifically designed for adults. So come on out on Sunday mornings at 9 o'clock for the empowerment hour. Uh, we have able-bodied teachers who are here to share the word of the Lord with you. So please make your presence known. And if you have a friend, bring your friend out with you or to share in that Bible study. Also, just as a reminder, Word Alive, every Wednesday at 11 o'clock here at the Second Baptist Worship Center. So come on out and be a part of that presently. We're continuing to study the book of Leviticus, and this morning we're going to be delving into chapter 14. Also, please know that we have the War, prayer, uh, war Room Prayer Line, and that's Sunday mornings from 11.30 to 12 noon and Thursday evenings from 7 to 8 p.m. The way you join that prayer line is you dial on your cell phone 605-313-4166, and then you put in the pen 
605-313-3330. Again, that phone number is 605-313-4166. And the pen is 103330. If, in fact, this Bible study has been a blessing to you, the ministries here at Second have been a blessing to you and your family, and you'd like to give monetary gifts uh, to this uh, church and to this leadership, the way to do that is you text SBGIBE, all caps. Again, that's SBGIBE, and the number that you will text it to is 28950. Again, that's 28950, and follow those prompts. Equally, we have, uh, you can scan the QR code and follow the prompts there, or you can mail uh, your offering to the Second Baptist Church located at 857 Lumber Street, Coatesville, PA, 19320. If, in fact, this pastor has been a blessing to you, and you would like to bless this pastor, this leader, you can text J-L-S-M-I-N. Once again, those are all caps. J-L-S-M-I-N. And you can text that to the number 28950 and follow those prompts. Also, just as a reminder, uh, the Men's Fellowship will have its meeting October the 21st at 9 a.m. Again, that's the Men's Fellowship October the 21st at 9 a.m. Obviously, that's this coming Saturday. So please make sure you keep this in mind. Let the brothers know about it. Make your way out here on Saturday at 9 o'clock. On October the 28th, which again is a Saturday, from 3 to 5, we will have Trump or Treat. Again, that's from 3 to 5 on October the 28th. We're reminded that we still need volunteers for the use of your trunk. So bring your vehicle out. Uh, make sure that your trunk is um, emptied so that you can put some goods in there. Uh, we're still in need of donations, uh, candies, and treats for, for the little ones. Uh, we also have a sign-up sheet here in the North X of the church. If you'd like to just donate some goods, please sign up on that sheet and say what it is you plan on bringing. Also, uh, on October the 30th, between October 30th and November the 3rd, there will be the gospel workshop held here at the Second Baptist Church. Uh, the youth will have their practice at 6 p.m. and the adults start at 7 p.m. The gospel concert obviously will be November the 4th. Uh, so please keep all these announcements in mind and govern yourselves accordingly. And that pretty much completes our announcements uh, for the events that are transpiring here around the church. And now we move towards that Bible study uh, that you are chopping at the bits to get to. This morning, I'm using the Amplified Bible. Uh, so it's, it's a conservative translation, a little different perhaps from uh, some of the others. But please listen in very carefully as we take a look at Leviticus uh, chapter 14. The word says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, This shall be the law of the leper on the day of his ceremonial cleansing. So in order uh, to declare that the leper has been cleansed, this is what the law of Leviticus says has to happen. It says, He shall bring, or he shall be brought to the priest at a meeting place outside the camp. So once again, you can't have those who have been declared lepers in close proximity uh, to the temple or to the place where the people gather. So it should be outside of the camp so that if in fact they are still infectious, uh, they will not uh, literally infect other individuals. Verse three says, the priest shall go out of the camp to meet him and the priest shall examine him. And if the leper has been healed of the infection of leprosy, then the priest shall give orders to take two live clean birds and cedar wood and scarlet string and hyssop for the one to be cleansed. And so all these events must take place. These items must be used in the declaration that this individual has been cleansed from their leprosy. Verse 5 says, Next, 
the priest shall order that one of the birds be killed as a sacrifice in an earthenware container over fresh running water. So one of the birds shall be killed, one shall remain alive, obviously. In verse 6, as for the live bird, he shall take it together with the cedar wood and the scarlet string and the hyssop, and shall dip them and the live bird in the blood of the bird sacrifice over the running water. And again, all these are stipulations uh, that are used to declare that this individual by the priest has been declared cleansed of their leprosy. He shall, verse 7, he shall sprinkle the blood seven times on the one to be cleansed from the leprosy and shall pronounce him ceremonially clean. Then he shall let the live bird go free over the open field. There is even salvation in the death of the one bird. The, the one bird obviously is left alive after being cleansed and after the running water uh, having rinsed off all the residue and uh, the blood from the, the sacrificial bird. Verse 8 says, The one to be cleansed shall wash his clothes, shave off all his hair, and bathe in water, and he shall be clean. And once again, part of the dynamics of the declaration is that this person, every part of him, shall be cleansed, shall be washed, or shall be rinsed, so that the declaration is to show forth that there is a new sense of cleanliness over this leper. Any questions or thoughts, brothers? Okay. So in in the remaining part of verse 8, it says, After that he may come into the camp, but he shall stay outside of his tent for seven days. So there's seven more days and he has to stay outside of his tent. He may come back into the camp, but just not in close proximity uh, to his family. Verse 9 says, On the seventh day, uh, he shall shave off all his hair. He shall shave his head and his beard and his eyebrows, even all his hair on his body. Then he shall wash his clothes and bathe his body in water and be clean. So after his clothes have been washed, after they have been rinsed, after all the hair on his body has been shaved off, not allowing any residue from any of the leprosy to remain on him, then this person is declared clean. Also, if in fact you are taking off all the follicles of the hair, there is no place uh, that you will not be able to see whether or not there's an infection that still remains on the individual's body. And again, remembering that the priests are the ones who's to do the examination and the declaration as to whether or not this person is clean. A lot of responsibility on the priest, and yet uh, this is the requirement according to uh, to Leviticus. And remember, uh, Leviticus are uh, the individuals, uh, the Levites, who were individuals who were assigned to making sure that anything that happened inside of the temple was what was supposed to happen in the temple. They were to protect it so that no infractions against the temple was happening. So they want to make sure it was clean, make sure everything was done just right. In the life of the 21st century, a place where we worship, it is a responsibility of both of uh, the pastor, the ministers, the diaconists, the servants, to make sure that there's nothing that transpires inside the place of worship that should not transpire. And in many instances, we become negligent in making sure that things uh, that should not happen don't happen. Uh, but it's time for us to step up to the plate and do what it is uh, that God has assigned to our hands. Any questions or thoughts, brothers? Yeah. In verse 10, the word says, Now on the eighth day, he shall take two male lambs without blemish. Very clear, two male lambs without blemish. And a yearling ewe lamb without blemish. Uh, remember, the ewe lamb is the female one that is most productive. And three-tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with olive oil as a grain offering, and one log about a pint of oil. And the priest who cleanses him shall present the man to be cleansed and his offerings before the Lord at the doorway of the tent of meeting. And so all of these things 
uh, qualifiers for what must happen in order for the declaration of this person to be clean. And there is no way for this person uh, to, to come into the camp, no way for them to come into their tent, no way for them to come into the place of worship unless all these things happen to declare that this person is now clean. Any questions, any thoughts? Do you see any, any parallelisms or anything that you can think of that might match up with what happens in the modern day church? Anything that sounds familiar? I know with COVID, they had to mask up. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I guess maybe that was a sign of being made clean or yeah. being kept clean. Yeah. yeah. Or at least making sure that we were not infectious to other people. Yeah. Yeah. And then you're sitting six feet away and yeah. distance and all that. That's right. Yeah, because in many instances, we are still excuse me, attempting to practice social distancing. We may not do it as stringent as we did early on during the pandemic, uh, but we're still conscious of the fact uh, that, yeah, uh, you know, if you're feeling sick, stay home. You know, if, if you know that you're infected, you don't want to infect other people. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so many individuals, even now, even though they may not be infected, they're still wearing a mask. Uh, we, hopefully we're still sanitizing our hands and things so that when we do reach out to individuals, our hands are clean and free of germs, hopefully. Uh, verse 13 says, let's see, did I stop at 13 or 12? 12. Okay, so, so 12 says, Then the priest shall take one of the male lambs and offer it as a guilt offering with a log of oil, and present them as a wave offering before the Lord. Verse 13, he shall kill the male lamb in the place where they kill the sin offering and the burnt offering in the sacred place, the courtyard of the tabernacle, for the guilt offering, like the sin offering, belongs to the priest. It is most holy. It is separated. It is to be set aside. And again, it is to be used by the priest recognizing that there is the Levite who's in control and responsible for the temple, and then there's the priest, and the priest, his uh, designation is that he is to stand before sinful humanity and before holy God. He is to be separated, uh, and, and that's what it means here, but uh, like the sin offering belongs to the priest, it is most holy. Verse 14 the priest shall take some of the blood of the guilt offering and pour it on the lobe of the right ear of the one to be cleansed and on the thumb of his right hand and on the big toe of his right foot. The priest shall also take some of the log of oil and pour it into the palm of his own left hand. And the priest shall dip his right finger in the oil that is in his left palm and with his fingers sprinkle some of the oil seven times before the Lord. Now all of this sounds uh, archaic and it sounds bizarre to us, yeah. but this is a practice that they had in that day and it was an act of being obedient to the commands of God. If God is saying, this is what you must do to show that you've been cleansed, then this is what you must do. In some instances in the life of the church today, there are some formats and some, some structure that we follow to show to the congregants that changes have been made in our lives. Case in point, uh, many of us are baptized. Uh, the baptism doesn't save you. Uh, it doesn't wash us clean. It is a symbolic act that says, this is what's transpired inwardly. Uh, I've been washed, I've been cleansed, and therefore, I can be perceived as a part of the body of, of the local church, but only after I've been baptized. One of the reasons why uh, we have the baptism as an initiating rite, because it declares to the world, changes have been made in us. Yeah. Uh, and usually you can't, can't or should not be involved in certain things in the church, cannot hold office until you've baptized, until you've been 
uh, declaring a part of that church. Here, it's you can't be a part of the local body, according to the Hebrews, until in fact there are offerings, sacrifices that are made, declaration of you being cleansed, and the declaration made by the priest, so that the priest declares that there's a change in you. Yes, sir. The ceremony that uh, that you did this past Sunday, now was that a christening or oh, the a blessing? blessing? That's a ble that's considered a blessing because in the Protestant faith, uh, Baptist, Methodist, Lutheran, what we normally do, and I shouldn't have said uh, Lutheran, and truth of the matter is I should just say Baptist because even uh, the Methodist and the Lutheran would have a tendency to maybe sprinkle or pour uh, the water over the baby. In the Protestant, the Baptist faith, we will only bless the baby. We, we won't pour water over the baby, we won't sprinkle water over the baby, but we may use the oil, and the oil is a sim symbolic representation of the Holy Spirit. And so when we put the oil on the baby and make the cross, it is a sign of the presence of the Holy Spirit sealing uh, that baby in its relationship. And that's the reason why we pray for protection and provision over the baby, uh, because they're little angels and they don't know the difference between what is right and wrong yet and what is sin. And so we're trusting God's angel to watch over them uh, as babies. So we don't, we don't do the christening. Uh, and <clears throat> even in the Catholic Church, they consider baptizing little babies. We don't. Because in the Protestant faith, we believe that you should be able to acknowledge what sin is and have a desire for a savior before we baptize you. That's the reason why in many instances, there was a time when we would say a child should at least be 12 years of age before we baptize them. And we got that mystical number 12. The truth of the matter is primarily from the Hebrews because the Hebrews perceive that at least around that age, a young, young male child goes through what is called uh, the bar mitzvah, and bar meaning son, mitzvah, of course, he becomes a son of the law. Uh, when it comes to the female, then it is the bat mitzvah, and bat meaning a daughter, so she becomes a daughter uh, of the law. And so at the age of 12, uh, they said, okay, you're old enough to know what's right and what's wrong. Uh, and so in the Protestant faith, uh, we, we really don't baptize them until they're old enough to know what's right and wrong. Yeah. In verse 17, the word says, of the rest of the oil which is in his palm, the priest shall put some of uh, on the lobe of the right ear of the one to be blessed, and on the thumb of his right hand and on the big toe of his right foot on top of the blood of the guilt offering. The remaining oil that is in the priest's palm shall be put on the head of one to be cleansed. You can see once again how important the oil is because again, it's the symbolism or symbolic of the Holy Spirit. When we, when we read from the New Testament, when it talks about uh, oil, again, the oil is symbolic of the presence of the Holy Spirit. Uh, when it talked about in the Old Testament where the oil ran down Aaron's beard, uh, even then that oil is representative of the Spirit of God engulfing or taking over that person. All of us need uh, the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is what we call our dunamis or our dynamite, our power. Uh, and when we have the Spirit, then we have the power. Yeah. Any questions, any thoughts? So, uh, mm. this night. Yeah. So, I'm trying to um, understand. Mm -hmm. So could anybody put oil, or does it have to be a, a like in our town? Um, yeah. It's got to be a minister, a pastor. Or... Well, well, the perception is you definitely should uh, should be called, should be separated, should be an individual that's designated as a cleric primarily okay. uh, to put the oil on the individual. However. Uh, the diaconists, the deacons, the servants can be individuals who can be relegated. Case in point, let's say you're in a church 
and the church presently doesn't have a pastor. What do you do if it comes time to bless a child? Well, uh, obviously the diaconists, the deacons, take over in leadership positions, so they're going to make sure uh, that that baby is blessed, or should make sure that that baby's blessed, if that's what the family is requesting. We, we don't bless babies until families ask us to. Uh, so you'll have, you may have babies that are a part of your congregation, uh, but they may not have been presented to the church to be blessed. Yeah. Yeah. So the bottom line is, yeah, there are times when individuals uh, can be blessed by someone other than the clerics. Okay. Yeah. The word goes on to say, the priest shall make atonement for him before the Lord. Next, the priest shall offer the sin offering and make atonement for the one to be cleansed from his uncleanness and afterwards kill the burnt offering. Verse 20, the priest shall offer the burnt offering and the grain offering on the altar and the priest shall make atonement for him and he shall be clean. You remember in many instances, uh, there are times when the Christ is preferred to as the high priest. And, and, and the Christ literally uh, is the individual who stands in, on our behalf before a holy God. And there is no higher priest than the priest uh, that Christ is for us. Uh, and, if you, and if you notice, we are not clean until the high priest declares us to be clean. Christ has declared us clean. Uh, by our embracing of Christ and accepting him. Uh, obviously, uh, the rejection of the Christ leaves us in a condemned situation. So we indeed are embraced uh, by Christ when we accept him, and then we are cleansed when we embrace Christ. In verse 21, the word says, But if the cleansed leper is poor, and his means are insufficient, then he is to take one lamb as a guilt offering to be waived to make atonement for him, and one-tenth of an ephod, a fine flour mixed with oil as a grain offering, and a log of oil, and two turtle doves or two young pigeons, such as he can afford. One shall be a sin offering, and the other a burnt offering, and so this gives allocation for individuals who may not have the wealth or substance that someone else may have. And so it gives a way out for individuals who are less fortunate. So if you don't, if you can't afford a lamb, or you can't afford uh, something of that magnitude, you can at least afford a pigeon dove, something that is of less value but sings the, uh, serves the same purpose. In verse 23, the word says, He shall bring them on the eighth day for his ceremonial cleansing to the priest at the doorway of the tent of meeting before the Lord. The priest shall take the lamb of the guilt offering and the log of oil and shall present them as a wave offering before the Lord. Next, uh, excuse me, verse 25, next, uh, he shall kill the lamb of the guilt offering and the priest is to take some of the blood of the guilt offering and put it on the lobe of the right ear of the one to be cleansed and on the thumb of his right hand and on the big toe of his right foot. And remember we declared the other day that the right side always designates as the seat or the side of authority and power. Uh, verse 26 says, The priest shall pour some of the oil into his left palm in his right finger, and the priest shall sprinkle some of the oil that is in his left palm seven times before the Lord. And remember, uh, numerically, when we talk about seven, we talk about the completeness, or it means the whole or the totality of a thing. In verse 28, the priest shall put some of the oil in his palms on the lobe of the right ear of the one to be cleansed, and on the thumb of his right hand, and on the big toe of his right foot, on the places where he has put the blood uh, of the guilt offering. The rest of the oil that is in the priest's palm 
shall be put on the head of the one to be cleansed to make atonement for him before the Lord. Then he shall offer one of the turtle doves or young pigeons which are within his means. So whichever one he can afford, that's the one that will be used. And it will be used as a sacrifice or as a sign uh, to God that he indeed is embracing the laws of God. In verse 31, he shall offer what he can afford, one as a sin offering and the other as a burnt offering, together with a grain offering. The priest shall make atonement before the Lord on behalf of the one to be cleansed. This is the law for the one in whom there is an infection of leprosy, whose means are limited for his ceremonial cleansing. And isn't it awesome to know that God makes a way for absolutely everyone? So even if you are impoverished, someone who doesn't have a whole lot, God has even made a way for those individuals. And that's what this is about when it comes to recognizing that some can afford a lamb, a ewe lamb, some can afford a ram, some cannot. Some have to use a pigeon dove, a turtle dove, uh, which is much more affordable. And this will be a declaration that this individual has been cleansed once it's presented to the priest and the priest declares them clean. Any questions or thought, anything that we may have gone over too quickly. Uh, so everybody's clear. All right. So we take a look at verse 34. And verse 30 says, When you come into the land of Canaan, which I'm giving you as a possession, and I put a mark of leprosy on a house in your land, then the one who owns the house shall come and tell the priest, I've seen something that looks like a mark of leprosy in my house. And imagine if this is Moses writing this particular book. And Moses says, when you come into the land of Canaan, remembering that Canaan is considered the promised land. This is the land that God says, I'm, I promised it to you. I'm going to give this to you. When you come into it and take possession of it, in the event you run across uh, disease in individuals or in a house, a declaration should be made so that the priest can come along and declare this place clean. Because there's, there's a good chance when you go into this land, you're going to run across some situation that you had not planned on encountering. Yeah. Many times when individuals purchase a new home or have a new home yeah. built, they will call on the pastor. Yeah. Yeah to come in and to bless the home. Can't tell you how many homes I've gone in, bless those homes, uh, the doorways, the entrances, the windows, uh, to ask God's spirit to bless those places uh, so that anything that goes in and anything that comes out will be a blessing and will be blessed. Yeah. Any questions or thoughts before I move on? What do you, what do you think, no, Mike? I'm just saying, he said, but, um, mm -hmm. We, well, about the blessed thing, that mm. you just said about uh, getting a Bless. pastor or something like that. Right. Who do you get a pastor? Can you do it yourself? Sure. All right. Sure. Yeah, you, yeah. It, it's just that most people would prefer uh, that they have someone to come in uh, who's been schooled yeah. in, in those areas and know uh, what the blessing is all about. Yeah. Uh, because some people will, will want oil placed over the door. Uh, which is a sign uh, that would suggest that again there is the presence of the Spirit of God. It may be symbolic, but to individuals, this is a sign that the Spirit of God is in this place, and anyone who comes in should be a blessing to our home. So, so my question is, mm -hmm. I know in the past different places I lived, mm -hmm. and a pastor wasn't available. Right. I just read dip, different scriptures in sure. different rooms. So is that is that called is that sure. blessing? Sure. Brother? Sure. That that's fine. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because I just you, you know if I'm doing it right. Yeah. I, I, you know I, I just, yeah. 
Well, the, the thing of it is, I mean, if you're going to live in that home, uh, you want God's blessing on your home. Yeah. So so you know what you want God to do in yeah. your home. Yeah. 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 It's it so. just, once again, it's just, it's been a practice where individuals will call upon uh, the priest, yeah. call upon the pastor, the minister, cleric to come in and, and to bless, you know, every floor, every yeah. entrance way into the home. Uh, because spirits are real. Yeah, you got, hey, yeah. I know. Yeah, that's right. Spirits, <laughs> spirits are real. Yeah. We sometimes forget how real they are. Yeah. yeah. In verse 36, the word says, The priest shall order that they empty the house before he goes in to examine the mark, so that everything in the house will not have to be declared unclean. Afterwards, <laughs> he shall go in to see the house. So already you recognize that he's designating there are certain things in the house so that they can be declared clean and unclean, and he needs to know the difference. In verse 37, he shall examine the mark. And if the mark on the walls of the house has greenish or reddish depressions and appears deeper than the surface, the priest shall go out of the house to the doorway and quarantine the house for seven days. Did you hear that? Okay. So for seven days, a complete week, they want to make sure uh, that this place is quarantined. Nobody goes in, nobody comes out. Yeah. So that there's no opportunity uh, for this infection uh, to come upon other individuals. Because if individuals are coming and going, and they come in, and this disease uh, has found its way on them when they exit, obviously they're going to take that disease and those germs yeah. somewhere else. In verse 39, the word says, The priest shall return on the seventh day and look. And if the mark has spread on the wall of the house, he shall order them to tear out the contaminated stones and throw them into an unclean place outside the city. Wow. He shall have the entire inside area of the house scraped, and the plaster that is scraped off shall be dumped in an unclean place outside the city and so you know that outside the city if they are putting these items on the dump it is to be burned uh, so that there's no potential for it to travel any further nor to impact or infect any other location so it's to be burned up and consumed uh, but again this is to be done outside the city then uh, they shall take new stones and replace the contaminated stones, and he shall take plaster and replaster the house. And so you can see that they want to make sure that this house, again, uh, is cleansed thoroughly. No stone, no brick, no plaster, anything uh, has been uh, preserved so that it does not uh, infect someone else that comes in. Any questions or thoughts, brothers? Okay. Verse 43 says, If, however, the mark breaks out again in the house after he has removed the stones and has scraped and replastered the house, then the priest shall come and look again. And if the mark has spread in the house, it is a malignant leprosy in the house. It is ceremonially unclean. Wow. So if after all they've done and it comes back, almost sounds like instances where a house has been uh, declared to have mold or mildew in it. And that house, once you've uh, disinfected it and cleaned it, and then all of a sudden it comes right back, you know that there is something else in that home that's leaving an impact on this mold and mildew, and you got to, in order to eradicate it, you got to tear out some walls. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You got to figure out where the dampness is coming from. It's the same way with the leprosy. You got to figure out where it's coming from so that it doesn't continue to come back. The priest must declare this place unclean. Uh, have either of you ever had? Uh, an incident where in your home, uh, let's say a commode 
uh, runs over or a sink is stopped up and it backs up in the home and all of a sudden you got it and it may be in the ceiling from upstairs, uh, it may be in the flooring below you, uh, and so all of a sudden this area becomes contaminated and it has to be thoroughly cleaned out. You may have to, on one occasion, uh, our drainage backed up in the house. And so we had to have the Brazilian cherry wood floor torn out. And so, of course, to get to it, to get beneath it, so that there's no potential for any mildew or damp, dampness or anything like that. So it has to be eradicated, then it has to be disinfected so that it doesn't cause any problems for the house or the family. Uh, and then we have a company, of course, that comes in uh, to, say, to say whether or not it's okay. Yeah. And that's what's happening here in the book of Leviticus. There are priests who are to declare whether or not it's clean or not. In verse 45, the word says, he shall tear down the house. You hear that? Mm -hmm. Because remember, they've taken the plaster out. They've taken the stones out. They've cleaned everything. They've disinfected it. They've gotten rid of it before. Uh, they've put new plaster and they put new stones in. And all of a sudden, it has come back again. And so verse 45 says, he shall tear down the house. Its stones and its timbers and all the plaster of the house. And shall take everything outside the city to an unclean place. So verse 45 is very clear in the fact that this house is so infected that it literally has to be destroyed. Wow. In verse 46, moreover, whoever goes into the house during the time that it is quarantined becomes unclean until evening. So even if you've gone in and this house was declared unclean and you were in there during the quarantine, then, the, then you've got to be declared unclean mm -hmm. because there's potential that you have some of this residue on you. That's the reason why in some, in, excuse me, in all instances, when an institution, a school, a house, any of them uh, have, uh, what is it, the, uh, the material that's in it, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of it, and my, my memory fails me right now. Um, oh, shucks. And they usually have to tear them down or, or completely or take out the flooring, the ceiling, and all this kind of stuff. Oh, I can't believe I don't remember the word for it. Mildew? Not the mildew, but... Uh, mold? Not the mold. Oh. Insulation, tell Yeah, that type of stuff. That they have, they yeah, have to tell yeah. Insulation and all right, yeah, and I, I, I can't remember what name, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's sad, I really, but yeah, the insulation and and all this stuff has to be completely torn out, uh, because there's the potential that it can be hazardous to other individuals, yeah. In verse 47, the word says, And whoever lies down in the house to rest shall wash his clothes, and whoever eats in the house shall wash his clothes. So anyone who resides in this house, uh, the clothes and everything has to be washed because you've got to be declared clean again. Uh, in verse 48, the word says, But if the priest comes in and inspects it, and the mark has not spread in the house after the house has been replastered, he shall pronounce the house clean because the mark has not reappeared. And that's, that's what you're looking for uh, in the house. And not only in the house, but symbolically, we want to make sure that this house, because this is the house that houses the temple. And we have to make sure that this house is cleaned uh, so that the Spirit of God can be present in us. In verse 49, the word says, To cleanse the house then, he shall take two birds and cedar wood and scarlet string and hyssop, and he shall kill one of the birds in an earthen container over running water. And he shall take the cedar wood and the hyssop and the scarlet string and the living bird and dip them in the blood of the slain bird as well as in the running water and sprinkle the house seven times. Verse 52. So he shall cleanse the house with the blood of the bird 
and with the running water, along with the live bird and the cedar wood and the hyssop and the scarlet string. But he shall let the live bird go free outside the city into the open field. So he shall make atonement for the house and it will be clean. Any questions or thoughts to this point? Okay. So as we close out this 14th chapter, we take a look at what's being said in 54 to 57. 54 says, this is the law for any mark of leprosy, even for a scale, and for the leprous garment or house, and for a swelling and for a scab, and for a bright spot on the skin, to teach when they are unclean and when they are clean. This is the law of leprosy in regard to both persons and property. So this whole chapter is designed to help the Israelites understand there are laws uh, that, the, that the Hebrews must work within when it pertains to leprosy and diseased skin, both in the person and leprosy when it comes to the whole, whether it is mold or mildew that is spotted in the place where they reside, because ultimately it will infect each and every individual who comes in. Any questions or thoughts? I know we finished this one just a little earlier. Uh, but I don't want to go to chapter 15 and because uh, we would never finish chapter 15. Yeah, that's a long chapter. Yeah, yeah. 14 was a long one. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so any questions, any thoughts before we close out for the morning? All right. So just as a reminder, make sure that you take a look at chapter 15. Uh, read over it. Uh, see what... Uh, the book of Leviticus has to say in reference yeah. to those areas and be prepared to dialogue next week. All right? All right. Let's close out in prayer for the morning. Again, I recognize it's a little early. Uh, Father, we thank you once again for the opportunity to come together in Bible study. We pray that as we've examined uh, the area of leprosy, we'll recognize, God, that there are some areas of our lives that needs your undivided attention. We know, without a doubt, God, that it can both impact ourselves as well as others around us. Help us to perceive, God, that we've been cleansed by your Holy Spirit, who indeed will declare us clean and right in your sight. Continue to bless us, and as you bless us, help us to be a blessing to others. We ask it all. In the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord, and we do thank you. Amen and amen. Again, we thank you for joining us this morning, and we pray that the Lord will bless you real good. See you next week. God bless. Pastor, do you want to